Ward Coffee, welcome to the Boardroom Podcast. Thanks for being with us. All right. Stoked to be here, man. Um, let's see. I have some questions for you. My first one, though, is sort of different. Um, what was the first, uh, or what was the last, excuse me, what was the last time you sang a song out loud? Sang a song out loud, like the entire song or just a verse from a song? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> whatever you know when was the last time you expressed a song well i kind of it's funny because i kind of do that all the time when i'm we're talking about stuff i'll whip out a lyric from a song or something like that and uh so i would have to say on a daily basis i'll do that because a lot of the a lot of lyrics and songs kind of express uh life happenings and, and they fit so well into that so that's yeah. kind of a vague way to answer a question but yeah what about um, music in general? Like, uh, have you seen, do you go out to live events? Um, not as much as I used to. Um, but the thing is, I listen to music all day long while I'm shaping, man. What are you listening to? Um, pretty eclectic stuff. Um, I'm kind of a jazz guy, for sure. Oh, interesting. That. Um, I kind of am fond to uh, 60s and 70s rock and roll, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like world music, Afrobeat, funk, you know, all that stuff. But uh, yeah, it just kind of comes and goes and it all weaves in to t depending on what I'm doing. But, uh, but jazz has always been a main mainstay since way back when. So Yeah. All right. Cool. That makes sense. Um, so let me talk about your shaping a little bit. Um, for those that don't know, Ward's from Santa Cruz, California. He's a, an iconic shaper from that region. And <laughs> Um, I'm guessing that you started shaping in the early seventies, uh, late seventies, nine, nineteen seventy nine. I shaped my first board. And who were some of your mentors? Like, how did you learn to shape surfboards in Santa Cruz? Um, well, I actually shaped my, my first board in 79, right by the lane there, right off Pelton Avenue on Laguna street. And, um, Dave Para, kind of me, Dave Para, and Jeff Scott, and a bunch of guys. They had Chicken Shack there that was like a little shaping shed and the glass shop. But I uh, shaped my first board, and I actually met Bob Pearson while I was surfing Four Mile on the first board I shaped. And he's paddled up to me and introduced himself. And, what do you got going on there, man? And I was like, Oh, it's a board I made. It's the six five little wing diamond tail and single fin, and I put micro grooves in the hot coat at the end, so it had these little little micro grooves and he's like, ah, it's super rad and things like that. And then he was like, well, I'm Bob Pearson. I shape boards, you know, and, and I can make you a better board, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he kind of, he kind of connived me into like, Oh, come and make my, you know, come and I'll make you a board. And I said, well, let me watch you shape a board. So that was kind of like the first thing, like, let me watch you shape. a board. And, um, are you still there with me? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Does, am I frozen or can you hear me? Yeah, well, I'm off screen right now. I've got some person swimming around with swim fins on, but um, let me just see here. Uh, I hear you loud and clear. And <laughs> okay, cool. Um, yeah, so anyway, gonna be, it's only going to be audio anyway. Even yeah, so that's doing. it's good. I'll just roll with it. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, I went and watched and shape a board, and I really had only watched. Well, funny, I'll backtrack even farther from that. So uh, super cryptic dudes, Mike and Jim Lolly. Um, these guys were kind of nor North Shore plants, uh, transplant guys, crazy individuals. If anybody from the 70s know the Lolly brothers, they were just crazy. Anyway, these guys were in Alameda when I was growing up for a short period of time. And Jim Lolly was like, dude, I can shape boards. I can shape boards. And my, my friend was like calling BS on him and so he came down and got a blank and brought him and shaped me a board. And so in my ma in our garage of our house, I watched Jim Wally shape a board. And this is like 1976, maybe. And he just blew foam all over the garage. <laughs> so pissed off. She was like, whatever. But that was the first time I watched somebody shape a board. And then I watched Joey Thomas shape one board. And then I sat and watched Bob shape my board. And um and it was really funny because he would be in there working away, going a mile, you know, really fast. He shapes really fast and he's all over the place. And uh, every time he'd walk out of the room, I would like check out the tools, grab the tools, and I'd put it on the board and I'd put it back really quick. Like, okay, whatever. And so anyway, we started our relationship. He made me another board. You know, 
he, he saw that I wanted to grab the tools. He saw I wanted to do it. And he's like, you really, you really want to shape more boards. You want to do this? And I was like, yes. And one thing led to another. I ended up working for, for him at the surf shop and then things started happening. And so at one point he says, all right, dude, I'm going to teach you how to shape it. These are the rules. These are how we do it. And um, so that was, those are the early days of my shaping. That's pretty cool. That's a great story. I mean, Bob Pearson is a, is a legendary shaping icon in his own right. So yeah. when he paddled up to you, were you like, oh, shit, this is Bob Pearson? Or were you like, who is this dude? Uh, pretty much who is this dude? Because uh, at the time, you know, Arrow was in its infancy that him and his brother just opened up a surf shop. And uh, Bob is a, a pretty colorful character. Character. I didn't really know him very much. Everybody was like, oh, there's Bob Pearson. He's got his his black and red O'Neill uh, O'Neill uh, animal skin wetsuit and uh, uh, brightly colored board or whatever. And, uh, but yeah, he, he had really super cool energy, super great energy, different from, from everybody at that time. Everybody was like way too cool. Everybody was like, dude, whatever. Um, but he was like super, super upbeat and stuff like that. So that was kind of neat. That was super neat energy. And that's what uh, I guess maybe drew me uh, to wanting to be uh hanging out with him and doing things because he was super excited about everything. And I was just super excited about surfing at the time. It was just and the micro grooves that you put in, I know that the guys at Sunset Surfboards were doing that about the same time. Is that the, did you get that idea from those uh, guys? Dude, it was right out of a surfing magazine. If you go back to Surfer Magazine, yeah. way in the back, they had micro grooves. And it was this thing. I was like, I want to do that. You know, Dave Perr is like, well, what do you mean? And I was like, yeah, we just, we get quarter inch tape and we lay them all up and then we do a couple of hot coats over and then we pull it up before it goes off. And we just, you know, it comes in back on the tail. And, and so, yeah, I, I, I thought it was deal, but you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure Peter magazine. Pierre, Peter St. Pierre, I think <laughs> was the guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you were riding your first surfboard when you met Bob, do you still have that board? Oh dude, I wish I had that thing, man. Yeah, no. It was it was a six five wing diamond tail. You know, one rail was like this, one rail was like that. You know, and yeah. um, and it had this uh, purple and green acid splash on the bottom with the cut lap on the rail. And yeah, that would be it would be hilarious to run. My first few boards were hilarious. And, yeah, you know, they're, they're probably like the the second board I shaped, uh, like completely shaped. You know, Bob had made me a few boards, so I was riding Bob's boards for a while, and I kind of was just not really shaping. And then when we we, uh, he got this shop space off uh, Mission Street Extension. We built this factory. It's like, okay, we're going to build this factory. You know, you have your own shaping room. Da, 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 da. And uh, at the time, it was like, okay, you're going to be my apprentice. You have to learn how to skim 100 blanks and get that right. Then I'm going to teach you how to put rocker in the boards. And then you're going to have to get that right and put V in it. Anyway, uh, we built the shop. I'm in there kind of doing it. And I was just like, I want to make my own board. So I just, I just shaped the board, start to finish. I airbrushed it. I gave it to Tony Mike because he glassed it. And Bob, Bob comes back. He's like, what have you done, man? And I was like, I made this, I made this foot <laughs> swallowtail, you know? And he's like, oh dude, you can't ride that thing. I don't want my logos on that thing, you know? So it was just another one of those, like, they're hilarious. But, but you know, I figured it out. We figured it out. It was pretty cool. <laughs> so you were eager. You're like, look, I'm not going through a two-year apprenticeship. Like I'm building boards right now. Oh, no, no. I was on it. You know, when I, when I knew, when, when I knew we were going to build this factory, I drove up to the Bay Area, I went to whole earth access. They had this whole stack of skill 100 planers and boxes that they were discounting and getting out the door. And I would just barely ponied up my $223 and 96 cents or whatever to get my planer. And I came back with my box and opened my planer. I was like, I got my planer. And this is before even the shaping racks were in the room. I'm like, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Do you still have that planer? I, it, it's in a very cannibalized state, uh, but I still have the the body and stuff. The motor needs to be rewound. I was so I was so bummed with that planer because I I I, I used that planer for I don't know, four or five years and a lot of lot of miles on that planer. And I took it into some uh, electric shop here in town, and the 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 guy who owned it. John's electric guy was really good. He started having his kid work in there, and his kid was like, "I know how to work on these things." I don't need. And he just blew my motor up and I just walked out of there in tears. Like, Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I've cannibalized it since, but my, my, you know, someday I'd like to have it redone and have it purring like <laughs> it's an original condition. But. What are you, what are you cutting boards with now? Are you, I, I, I'm under the assumption that you're still strictly shaping 
completely by hand, but are you, is that right? Or are you doing computer cuts? Um, I'm doing everything by hand now. Um, I still have, I've, I've probably scrubbed out less than 50 computer shapes over the years. I've dabbled with it and played with it. And it's, it's been fun, but um, I still like hand shaping and at some point I'll get there sometime. I'll, I'll, I'll do that, but I'm not running towards that. I'll, I'll get there, you know, but yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I'm just still using skill planers. Um, I've got a bunch of different cutting heads on it. I've got this really neat cutting head that these guys made up in uh, British Columbia, uh, up in Canada, that's got multiple carbide tips on it. And then I've got the, the barrels that I use for EPS. And then I've got traditional blades that I swap in and out. Yeah. And have you, have you ever picked up one of those accurate planers that Ben does down here in San Clemente? I have. They seem like really wonderful things. They just, they just purr. And uh, at some point I might get my hands on one. They seem a little bit bigger than my skills. Yeah. A uh, um, little bit bigger and bu- more bulky. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, but they're, they're, a, they're a premium. They're expensive. So. Yeah, they are. Yeah. I like them. Um, let's get back a little bit to your time in Santa Cruz in the seventies. And I'm wondering if there, can for the listeners who don't know, can you characterize the Santa Cruz surfing scene by decade? Like if I was to say, what were the '70s like for you, and what were the '80s like as far as your experience? What were the '90s like? And you know, yeah. can you kind of go through that real quick? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I grew up and I started surfing Ocean Beach up in the city, and um, and then I moved down to Santa Cruz in '78. So I can't really say. I'm definite yeah. authority on surfing in Santa Cruz in the seventies. But when I moved down in 78, it was, it was a pretty locked down low key deal. you know, there's a few guys that, you know, at the lane and at Stockton Avenue and guys at pleasure point. And it was pretty much, you know, everybody was, like I said, everybody was way too cool. Everybody was just pretty much down low and, you know, black wetsuits, white surfboards, you know, it was still single fin era. Twin fins are just really Art and jo- Joey Thomas was really starting to write twin fins more often and stuff. And, uh, and you know, I stopped you there. If I can, do you think it, it takes somebody like Joey Thomas who had a, a lot of clout, I believe in that area at that time, <laughs> and still does, um, to, to introduce something new. Like if you or some, some kid would have showed up with a twin fin might've got heckled, but with Joey doing it, did it kind of help open up the concept? Well, yeah, anytime you go to an area and there's a good surfer riding a particular piece of equipment, people look and pay attention. They say, well, that's the deal. That's cool, man. And so, yeah, Joey was, you know, riding the twin fins, riding them well. And um, so, yeah, there was a whole little following with that. And that's, you know, and ironically, ironically here, you know, guys are riding twin pin, uh, pintail twin fins. That was like the board round during that. Yeah. That's the Joey board. Is that right? Yeah. No, that's everybody's. I mean, the first board Bob made me was a pin, a pintail twin fin, you know? So, um, yeah, that was. Oh, well, I interrupted you. I apologize. So tell me about the eighties. How would you characterize the eighties? Well, I mean, the eighties, I mean, just pop culture and the eighties was a complete, you know, left turn away from yeah. what was happening in the 70s. 70s was, you know, it was Crosby, Stills, and Nash, everybody smoking joints and being too cool for everything and just kind of tuning out of everything. And, and then the 80s went kind of crazy. Everything went bright colors, you know, anything goes, music scene changed, you know. And the 80s for me, working at Arrow, we, you know, working for Bob and working at Arrow was, was, was like this awakening, this opening thing. Because it was like working at Arrow and working – Writing Bob's boards was like an unpopular thing in the beginning. I put up with so much crap from the established crew. It was like, beat it, get out of town, dude. Don't even. And who, who do you mean these... like guys that were riding houts or like just all yeah. the West Side guys? Oh, absolutely. If you were not riding a hout, yeah. Joey Thomas, you were out, dude. Forget yeah. it. Not, don't even paddle out. Don't even jump off the point of the lane. Don't paddle out the ave, whatever. And, and so I had to put up with a few years of that, of guys, you know, Putting the putting the putting the clamps down and <laughs> various other things, but um, and it was not a popular thing. But moving into the '80s, Arrow and we had the energy. We were coming down surfing the comps. We were we were doing stuff. I got in a couple movies and magazines and stuff, and things changed. Things changed yeah. radically, and all these all these naysayers, all these people that were were starting to ask around, like, hey, like can I get a board, man? You know, it's, and, and so, you know, some of the guys that, that I would headbutt with next thing you know, are 
on the team and we're going down to surf contests and doing stuff. And yeah, there's, there's like classic, you know, rim partridge. I don't know if you know who he is. I, I know. Rim, yeah. Yeah. So he would, he would, he used to come into, cause I worked at the surf shop for a long time while I was learning the shape. So he would come into the surf shop with his brand new hat and go check this board out, Bob. Wish you could make boards like that. And Bob's like, I'm going to make you a better board someday, Rim. I'm going to get you on the boards. And Rim's like, oh, yeah, whatever. Now, Rim is the biggest disciple ever. You know, yeah. there's a long list, a litany list of, of people that are the same exact thing, you know. And and it's just, it's just. Was really- Richard Schmidt like that? Or the, who's the other classic big guy that just passed away? His, his name's uh, Vince Collier. Vince. Yeah, was Vince like in oh, that Vin- that changed their tune? Here, here's the class. Here, he never really rode arrows, but see, Vince was a, J, a Joey Thomas guy, and there's a lot of Joey Thomas guys, and they're all riding his boards. But Vince is classic because Vince, myself, and Richard Schmidt, we were all born in 1960, three days apart. You know, I think Vince's birthday was the 10th, Richard's the 12th, mine's the 13th. Anyway, we're all the same age. So Vince was a JT guy, and Vince was gnarly on everybody, including myself. You know, I think I dropped in on his girlfriend one time, and he he wanted to punch me out. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry, bro, whatever. But at the time, when I was – Bob was teaching me how to shape boards. Vince really, really, really wanted to start shaping his own boards. And JT would have nothing to do with it. He was like, no dice, dude. It's on – you're on my boards or you're out here. So Vince and I became friends. Because he was like, so what's Bob teaching him? So how, you know, how are you using your plane? How are you turning the rails? What do you, so we kind of had this really cool line of communication going. And, uh, and I actually take him, I took him up to Ocean Beach. It might've been for the first time because I knew in the fall time when Ocean Beach was lighting up. So I was like, dude, you'd be flat in Santa Cruz. And I was like, Ocean Beach is four to six foot, which you need to go up there. It's offshore. It's good. So I'd, we would do these little surf missions and we would go down south, but we were always talking about shaping, always talk about it. And finally, Vince, Vince made the break. And he started making his own board. So um, that was kind of a funny little thing, you know, and, uh, you know, yeah. super, super flamboyant yeah. character, classic, a classic character. So. And do you think that the, the, I know that there was a definite East side, West side divide. There was like the pleasure point scene <laughs> and, and the West side scene, including steamer and all the little spots up North, just North of there. But yeah. Um, does that divide still exist today or is there more of a homogenization of that? It, it, it's funny that, that it exists in the minds of the older people and it exists in the minds of the younger people that are emulating the older people. But by and large, it is fluid, man. It's everybody's kind of moving and stuff. It's just kind of the established guys, at the established spot, spots. You see guys at Stockton, you see guys at Sewer Peak and, you know, guys go back and forth like, oh, what are you doing on this side of town? But it's none of this beat it, go back to the east side, you know, beat it. You know, you don't see that anymore. Everybody's pretty chilled out on on that. And it's just because of the numbers of people in the lineup. Yeah. So people are a little more accepting to it. But you'll go out at Stockton some days and guys, it doesn't matter where you're from. They're pretty much, dude, <laughs> you're not in the rotation. There's there's four waves in a set and there's five of us out here. And uh, that's yeah. Life, bro i mean it's like that at any spot really you know so. yeah I, w- I wish it was but I, it's a little different up there for sure yeah. um but does does that see i sense that from what i'm gleaning off of instagram and stuff that pleasure point and the east side is kind of is kind of done like there's a lot of money that moved in that bought homes there's a lot there's a lot more like surf school vibe and maybe like post covid vibe and I'm wondering if that's the same up there on the west side, or is it still have a little bit more lockdown like Stockton, like you just mentioned? Uh, I, I encourage anybody and everybody to watch the watch Surfline, watch the cam at the lane on any given day, and you will watch the see the level of surfing <laughs> is a, a, approaching beginner to intermediate on average everything. So you can say the lane's done. It's just overrun with people. The pleasure point, you can say that too. But when there's swell, the swell is the equalizer. You know, there's, there's still tons of waves. And um, as much as part of me goes, yeah, it's really crowded. It's done, this, that, and everything. And I still go, there's tons of empty waves. It's how you look at it and what corners you want to go. And then the North Coast is still pretty wide open. Right. Um, so... 
And but, but you're generally a West Side guy. Like, do, I mean, do you ever trickle down to to surf pleasure? Um, I surf the summer. I surf, I surf the point a few times. I'll go surf the what uh, the the hook. My wife loves to surf the hook. Yeah. So, um, and then when our boys were young, we surfed over at the hook quite a bit. Um, I love surfing over Silver Peaks. Probably one of the best waves on the South Swell in Santa Cruz. No question. Yeah. But I because I live on the West Side, my shop's on the West Side, and then I can basically go up Swift Street and turn left and the whole North Coast starts from there. I've always gravitated that way. I surf four mile a ton because I just like the walk-in effect and yeah. seeing a house. Yeah. Um, it's a beautiful cove. The waves are fun. And then I'll surf Scots and the reefs up above there. So yeah. um, and I, I like more wilderness open space than I do um, urban surfing. Yeah. I'm not yeah. much of a, I pull off the edge of the cliff, jump into my wetsuit and go join, join the throng. I'm not really that kind of guy um although i'll do it out of necessity but yeah yeah i hear you i hear you um well i was asking you about the, the different decades so yeah the 80s were obviously pretty loud and proud and a big change a, a big yeah. a big change and um yeah. you know geometric figures on surfboards and bright colors and all of that yeah. and a lot of the best surfers in santa cruz at that time and i'm i'm thinking like rufo was a young kid that you know like a teenager yeah. and, and all yeah. of these guys sort of adopted to that and um so the 90s was more or less similar to that or no yeah i mean it was a, it was an extension of it and um you really started you know 90s was when mavericks got discovered so the big wave scene started coming on and then there was this really large pack of guys um you know the the rap boy and uh, there's there's the whole whole list of guys that really got tons of press and we're getting tons of magazine and movie material and flea went in the, the Mavericks event and Barney, that whole crew. Yeah. So there was an extension to that. And then that just drew that, in my opinion, drove things even more crazy. Like anything goes, we can be wild men and people still love us. Uh, and surfing kind of, kind of went in my opinion, kind of a rough area, a yeah. rough patch of area. Um, in well, there was a lot of drugs, right? I mean, a lot there was a lot of drugs, man. A lot, a lot of the crystal meth that kind of, you know, yes. went sideways. Yeah, there was a lot of good examples of very bad examples. Um, and yeah, it was it was pretty. And so, tell me about the the two thousands or going into the twenty teens or even now the twenty twenties. Is there is it harder to define those last three decades? Or does it seem like it's just the 2000s? Yeah, it's, it, to me, it almost seems like a blur because, I mean, I've been so immersed in the surf industry and in surfboards. So I look at it more what the trends were in surf designs over the years. So that's kind of dictates the, the eras. But I also, you know, opening my own shop, having a family, my kids growing up, that's where the, the definitions really start playing into it. Um, but, you know, like if you just took board designs alone, you know, the 90s, the late 90s, that was like a true apex of the anorexic surfboard designs. Boards were really thin. They had tons of rocker to them. They're really narrow. You know, your average shortboard was <laughs> four to five inches longer than what we ride now, you know. And then now everything's toned back down. Uh, you know, fishes and mid lengths and all that stuff are back in vogue now. And so it's, it's like the spiral that goes down and it comes back up and then it goes back down. So, um, but I don't tell me, do you think that we'll ever get back to that sort of supermodel anorexic 1992 surfboard? Ooh, wow. Um, those were so hard to ride. Like, like that's, if that's what Kelly was riding and all the guys on the tour were riding, it was hard for the average person to ride that kind of board. And so the, my opinion is that's why the longboard resurgence came back. Cause guys, guys that were in my age demographic were like, I can't ride sharp boards anymore. I'm just going to go to a, a high performance longboard and I can still catch all the waves I want, but I can still get my wriggle on and feel like I'm ripping, you know, that's a great insight. Actually. I never yeah, thought I, of that eighties, nineties longboard revival as a, I knew it was a response to old guys not riding shortboards, but I just yeah. made the connection that's because the shortboards were so crap, or yeah. at least for us old guys. They were just hard to ride. Right. If, you, if you took the average shortboard in 1985 and you, and you took what Tom Kern was riding in 1985 or whatever, the average guy could get on that board and ride that board okay because of the, the, the flat, yeah. the volumes, the widths on them. And it, 
the average guy could ride with a pro bike guys in the nineties. There was no way, man. And you'd see a bunch of guys out there trying to, trying to go on these things. And you're like, Oh dude, you need flatter rocker, more foam. Like get on a hybrid, bro. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that's, that's um, that, yeah. Like I said, that's really great insight. The, the one thing that I, and maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Maybe I haven't thought this through enough, but when I'm thinking about Santa Cruz, for me being a kid who, you know, was a teenager in the eighties, 90s, 2000s, all that. I saw heroes from Santa Cruz come through the magazines, come through the print. Yeah. You know, I saw the whole scene. And I even saw, you know, from looking in old mags, I saw the Joey Thomases and the Houts. And the, there was guys in Santa Cruz um, in the late 80s. Um, Kevin, who was the guy doing it? Kevin Reed. Kevin Reed. Kevin. Yeah. There was a whole crew of guys that I, as a guy in San Diego, learned about. Like, oh, Santa Cruz. I was like, whoa, Santa Cruz is, is heavy or whatever the – yeah. The magazine was telling me about Santa Cruz. I digested. Yeah. And now, I, because Prince dead, um, of course, there's Peter Mel, who's incredible. But and he's yeah. he's you know, luckily he's there doing WSL stuff. But besides Nat Young, who is sort of you know, he's still out there. But he, there, it it just doesn't seem like I'm getting fed. Santa Cruz surf heroes the way I was because the yeah. print is dead. Do you think that that's true? Like who's the, who's the next Santa Cruz surf hero? I mean, it can't be Nat Young. He's 32 or something. Yeah. Yeah. He just turned 30. Um, yeah. It's, it's an interesting thing. And I have a very strong opinion uh, about particular things, but like Let's I hear it, word. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm not going to throw any. I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. No, I don't want that either. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. But you know, the yeah. early night. What happens in the early '90s is, yeah, there was a whole crew of guys that got a lot of publicity and and got a lot of stuff via magazines and movies and stuff like that. But also in conjunction with that, there was a lot of their peer group that started working for surfer surfing magazine in the other areas and so they were they were able to get their profiles perpetuated for an incredibly long time they were coming back into the loop again and again for for way longer than what was typically normal of the time um, because there was a whole infrastructure around the exploits of things they did um, and it didn't give any oxygen to anybody that was coming up and and honestly it wasn't until Nat jumped on the scene. There were, there's probably one or two generations of guys that were pretty underground that were just as good as the established crew, but they just never really got any air. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of that way now too, not in the sense that there's just not a lot of energy there. Um, there's a lot of guys surfing. I mean, I mean, I, I can blow my boys horns. I, they both. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Stuff. My, my younger son, Sam surfing on the QS and, you know, doing that and, and getting a lot of stuff, but I don't say it's a generational thing. You usually have generations of, of packs of guys or gals that come through and they feed out each other and it kind of goes, well, I think we're maybe in a slump right now. We're in a lull. Um, but there's some neat stuff. There's a bunch of neat kids coming up right now. Um, yeah. Media, media in itself is really diverse. You know, how do you get your media? And, and I asked my boys, like, where do you get your media from? And, oh, well, we look at stab or we look at this or we look at that. And I'm like, you know, it's not Surfline or it's not this or not that. And, and people are like, well, yeah, we do that too. But there's all these different things. Yeah. Get, get our, get our media and info from. So. Yeah. It's just so. Roundabout way to answer your question. Well, it's interesting, right? Because like I said, for whatever reason, Surfer and Surfing Magazine and Transworld or whatever would provide us with, here's, here's Santa Cruz. Yeah. And yeah. from a guy down in San Diego, I don't see, I don't have, and maybe that's just me because I'm not tapped into the right distribution point, but I don't get any, here's what's happening in Santa Cruz anymore. Yeah. You know, I get tons of Mavericks and guys yeah. from Santa Cruz that are charging Mavericks, yeah. but I don't get you know, the thing that we used to get, which is, this is the Santa Cruz scene, you know? Yeah. And maybe yeah, that's yeah. good for you guys in the long run. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, I remember the, uh, the, the surfing magazine that came out with that article that Matt or Sam George did called Cold Power and me and Bud Miller had some, some really nice shots surfing up above Scott's and stuff. And I caught a bunch of shit for that, man. I got flack for that big time. You know, I got big time. And I was like, Maybe we shouldn't, maybe people don't want to know. I don't want to know about the Santa Cruz surf scene because I don't want to get beat up, man. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, it's just, uh, 
you know, when we get a mag, when magazines come out, we grab them, we just, we just look at them, we just absorb them, absorb them, and then pass them around. And the next thing you know, they're all dog-eared and in a corner. But, um, but now media just goes zing, 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 zing. And, and so it's hard to really get a full impression on certain areas of yeah. a like, Oh, this is the, this is the pulse on this area. You know? So. Do you think if somebody um, was naive enough or ignorant enough or ballsy enough to do like a, uh, some sort of YouTube or some sort of video expose on those beautiful places that you're talking about that are North of town, that there would be any ability to kind of, like rein it in or should it be reined in like in a weird way it's like i see it's almost a golden time for you because all of the energy seems to be on pleasure point like all of silicon valley everyone's riding soft tops at pleasure point <laughs> and all that media attention i don't know if media my point is is that there's it's almost better up there because it's, all it's, the energy is down here well the, the reality is it's the same thing all the way up the coast and everywhere i mean you go you go to you go to Four Mile, Davenport, Waddell, Scotts. There's people paddling out on wave storms. There's kooks out there too. It's yeah, it's yeah. there's just there's more humans in the water up and down the entire coastline. It's not focused at Pleasure Point by right. stretch of the imagination. It's everywhere you go. So, um, but like I said, in the fall and the winter when the waves are really doing it, the the surf regulates the lineups to an extent, and then you just yeah. have better surfers vying for the better waves. But the, but the kooky thing, I mean, I've always had the saying, kooks are like kelp. They grow thick and get in your way in the summertime. And in the winter, the big waves rip them out and throw it up on the beach. You know, and that's been my mantra for, for 30 years, man. <laughs> so that's a great. Yeah. You know, analogy. <laughs> but I don't like to call people kooks. That's just, you know, that's no, bad, I, I, bad I, for I, business, I, man. You know, <laughs> well, and, and yeah, I agree with you. You know what? I mean, <laughs> I probably could point the finger at myself before I do anything. Um, uh, yeah, I'll be super honest with you, Scott. When, you know, I've, I've, over the years, I've come down to surf down south and stuff. And I'm, I mean, when the, my boys were really young, they were probably like five and 10 or five to 10 years old. I can't remember. We'd, we, we'd come down the south surf all the time. But when they were that age, we came down in our camper and we were, we were surfing at, um, we were surfing at Cardiff, man. Yeah. And I remember paddling out there. And how mellow everybody was. And there was cats on longboards. There was guys on fishes. There was guys on high performance shortboards. And I just looked around and I said to my wife, I said, these dudes have it figured out, man. They're, everybody's surfing and everybody's got a smile and they're chilling. They're not like longboards over there, or, you know, kooks over there. It was just everybody was crossing over. And I was like, they've kind of got it figured out. And you know what? That's hap it's happening up here too now. Everybody's kind of a little more chilled out. And so, yeah, that's an observation. Yeah. Good. Well, let's um, shift gears a little bit and talk about shaping some more. Yeah. Um, I just did an interview with two guys from France that are making surfboards with a 3d printer. Oh it's, yeah. It's fascinating. Oh yeah. What are your yeah, thoughts yeah. on the way the speed at which building a surfboard seems to be changing and has changed? Um, yeah, it's, I, I'm going to give you a super long winded answer and it's going to be like far reaching. So if you go back, um, like I said, I shaped my first board in 79, I shaped my another board in 81. And it was like, I told my dad, this is a magic board. My dad's like, well, what's it, what's magic about it. And I was like, it just does everything I want. I just think about it and it just does it. Right. Well, my dad was a printed circuit designer in the Bay Area before they called it Silicon Valley. He's been in the electronics industry from the late 50s to the early 90s. And he said, well, let me show you something. I'm doing some beta testing for this upstart company that's designing some this program based on a Bezier curve that, that uh, lofts curves numerically and you can, you can control the data points where And it was all for doing printed circuit design, 3D drawings like that. And he goes, we can take this program and we could make it talk to some of this uh, hard this, uh, machinery that's over at the Ames Research, and we can make a shaping machine. And I was like, yeah, there's no soul in that, bro. Nobody wants 
to do that, you know? And my dad's like, oh, it'd be a fun project, you know? And at the time, I think Barlone in France is the only guy that had like a, a really rough shaping machine. Anyway, I kind of blew that off. And, but at the time, I was just learning how to shape boards, man. It just, so going forward in time and the advancement of this stuff, you know, the whole industry, 95% of the industry is getting pre-cuts on, on a CAD thing, you know, CAD-driven design on a, a CNC machine. That's just how it is. And, but the big, the big bottleneck in surfboard production has been the glassing. Okay. So you could shape a bazillion boards, but it's just, it takes really long to get them glassed. And so when you go even farther and you start thinking about 3D printing, you go, whoa, wait a minute. Okay. We're doing a bunch of different materials out of a 3D printer now. You know, they're, you know, they're doing, they've got this, they've got like probably the best 3D printers in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where they're, you know, they're making cars and stuff out of it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You can kind of go, Hey, super rad. Let's print out the core, which is a light density foam. Let's pr print out a higher density shell on it and then pr print out even a higher density matrix of resin and fiber or whatever. And bingo, you've got a board. Um, so super interesting on that level and uh, technology and intellectually speaking, it's like, wow. But that all comes at a cost, you know, like how much do those machines cost? Is it, is it available for the average dude? Um, but super interesting. Yeah. That's how you can control stuff. Build it. It's just re it's just reverse engineering. Really. Is what These guys have, um, I think they have three machines. Yeah. It takes, takes 20 hours for one board, a short yeah. board. Yeah. And they're using a uh, sugar cane plastic. Yeah. Is what the, so it's a bio-based plastic. Yeah. And I was so naive. I thought that they put this stuff in there and then the machine cut it away. But it, oh, actually, no. it actually builds. You add. Yeah, you, you add, add to it. It's an add. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't even know that. I just learned that the other day. Yeah, it's one little one little thing at a time. Bip, 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 bip. Yeah. yeah. You can get the speed up to that and get, get stuff laid out. I mean, that's how they do so many things now. Like the, for building molds for boats and things like that, they'll just they'll just print stuff out. They'll just print stuff and go from there. And um, yeah, super interesting. Um, it's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. And I know that the glass schedule is a little bit different. Like once that thing is finished after hour 20, they basically just brush it off. There's no real sanding to get it prepped. Oh, or ready yeah. Or yeah. Or anything. I would think so. And then it's yeah. a normal schedule. Like it's four ounce with boat resin or what, you know, just poly resin or whatever. So there yeah. is but see, they, the neck that you talked about still exists. Yeah. But they still have, to, they still have to do some hand laminating. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. See, that's the, that's the whole thing is like if they can get it, the next step of where the, the last printing is the resin matrix with a fiberglass, um, then you're, then you're home. But if you stop to have some dude pull a sheet of glass out, wet it out, cut it, and you got to have somebody do all those, you're, you're still back to square one. Yeah. Interesting. Um, well, as you mentioned, you do all of your shaping by hand mm -hmm. and you have for a long time and people might not know this um, that are just, you know, that, that aren't, hip to what's going on but uh well i didn't mean like that but just aren't, aren't knowledgeable about your and i experience because you have been involved with the with the boardroom show which was then the sacred craft and is now the boardroom show yeah. as a competitor in <laughs> our shaping competition yeah fact, the last time i talked to you you were like dude i need some money for driving down here from santa cruz to shape <laughs> and i hear what I apologize to you in public because I was just running around like a freak. <laughs> I remember thinking to myself, why did Pat Rawson call Ward? I've got 50 shapers here that could just step in and do this thing. <laughs> but uh, so remind me, I'm going to send you some money for your effort. I, I did, I, you, you, don't, you don't owe me money. It's Rawson because Rawson said he's going to pay me because <laughs> he called me up like less than 24 hours before the shape time was, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember. I was like, Pat, what are you doing? I mean, we love Ward, but I got 30 guys in here that'll step in and shape, you know. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, but so tell me about your experiences in the shape off um, in the icons of foam, the tribute to the masters. I believe, were you in the very first one where we honored Mike Diffendorfer? No, no, no. That was, um, that was the first show um, I came down to. Um, because I wanted to watch Terry Martin shape boards. Oh, how cool is that? Martin was, he was not in the competition, but he was in the Hobie booth shaping, right? 
I think Terry might have been in the competition, actually. I, okay. I don't recall. I could look on the, on the trophy and see. But, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I came down for the very first one because I wanted to watch Terry Martin shape. Because I'd really, being up in Santa Cruz, I just have only seen a handful of guys shape at that time. And I'm like, okay, this guy's shaping more boards than any human on the planet. Everybody, he's just a legend on how he gets stuff done. So I came down to the show. I elbowed my way right up to the side of the window there, and I watched him shape a board. And I was unabashedly like, I'm going to watch this cat shape, man. I'm going to see how he does it. And then afterwards, I was like, hey, Terry, Ward Coffee from up in Santa Cruz. I really enjoyed watching. He's like, oh, cool. you know. And he was like, okay, Santa Cruz, what, what's happening up there? And how long have you been shaping for? And um, So that was pretty neat. And then the next year, you invited me to come and do the caster show. Right, right, right. So you and did so the I, caster. I shaped, I shaped the caster one. And uh, that's what was that experience like for you? I, I well, going that, into that bubble and having people watch you and dude, that's the heaviest thing ever. It's it's super it's super heavy because you got an hour and a half to copy this board and you're in a fishbowl and everybody's watching your moves and so you're all nervous, you're all jittery, and uh, you just got to lock in and do it and. Um, so that one, first one was really cool. Uh, I know Ricky and I, it was nip and tuck either way. Um, we were down to the finals. I think he, he had the channels a little more sorted than I did or whatever. But the super rad thing about that was that after I shaped my board, Terry Martin walked up to me and he said, hey, I watched you shape your board. I really enjoyed doing that. You've, you've kind of got your chops down. Um, I really enjoyed how you did this and that, everything like that. And I was just like, that point, I was like on cloud nine. I'm like, okay, God just talked to me. <laughs> you know, and like you said, I'm okay. And he kind of gave me the thumbs up and maybe the secret handshake to be in the club. I don't know yet. But so that was like, wow, that was super, super cool. And, uh, and that was a great experience. That was, yeah. and um, when That's I drove cool. home, you know, I threw all my tools back in the van and drove home. I was like, oh man, that was cool. I really, I really like this. I really feel yeah. for the club, you know? So. Um, and then what? The next one that you were involved with, I believe, was was it the Hout one, or did you do something before that? No, it was the Hout. It was the Hout one. I'd been, I'd come down for a couple other ones, but it was the Hout one. And, and Doug Hout calls me up one day, and you know, I knew the show was happening, and it was a tribute to him or whatever, and it was going to be in Santa Cruz. And uh, so he said, "Yeah, I want to do this," and I really Doug, and I didn't. I just was like, I had I had worked in the Hout shop for six years. I had a shaping room right next to Doug for six years, and uh, but I was really really like flattered like oh wow Doug wants me to do it so that was cool and the super gnarly thing about that show for me was that Bob Pearson was in that show Steve Coletta was in that show uh, Bob taught me how to shape Steve really showed me how to run a planer um, and then Mark Angel was in that show and Mark Angel when I first came to Santa Cruz Mark had moved to Hawaii but he was still this he was the first guy that that I saw that like everybody would go Oh, Mark Angel, you know, like guru. He had this mystic thing. Uh, and I was like, so he was in the show. And, and I know he worked with Hout for years and years and years. And then Wayne Rich was there. And Wayne Rich was the defending champion at the time. And he had this pit crew. You know, he had a whole crew of guys. And he was super gnarly. Like, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and so that show was crazy. And, um, and the, the craziest thing about that show is we had all that funky weather. It hailed and all that stuff. And uh, that board that we were supposed to replicate was going through the house shop at the, at the same time. And I was getting boards glass at that time. And I avoided that board at all costs. Like it was easy. It would have been easy for me to grab the rails or put on a rack. But I was like, I turned a blind eye. I was like, I almost ran out of that shop. Like, no, no, no. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to look at it because I wanted so much to be in the moment of just measuring the board and shaping the board, you know? And, um, and that, that shape off was super, super crazy. The floor, I remember stepping, everybody's complaining about the floor and the racks moving and stuff like that. And it's like, actually the way I walk up and down the floor, I get a rhythm with the way it was going. And then the most insane thing was, is I finished the board pretty, pretty early, but I still had to cut the bump into it. And I remember the one little, one little dinky pearl of wisdom how it gave me goes, I always do my bumps last. Wow. I was like, okay. And I had watched a bunch of other guys cut their bumps in the beginning. And I was like, what the hell, you know, I got the board done. I still had 15 minutes left. I had not done the bump. And 
here's a board that's basically done. It's like, okay, how says he puts them in last. So I'm going to get my planer and I'm going to cut the bump in. And I'm just about ready to cut, cut it in. And Rusty and Wayne Rich are standing at the end, end of the, I could see their view and they're standing there with their arms crossed. And it was kind of like Wayne had that look on his face, like in, in Caddyshack or whatever, where they're like going to take the putt. And he was like, well, <laughs> well, and I just took my planer and I did a, two little passes on the inside and then two bigger passes. And also my planer found its line. I went, Holy Toledo. I, I, this is what Hout's talking about. And it, anyway, I cut, I cut the concave in, I cut the spec in and it all worked out and I finished it up and it was done. And anyway, at the end of the day, I ended up winning. And that was really cool. Yeah. You were the big winner and that's, that's so cool. Right. Because yeah. I mean, you had, as you mentioned, you had all these guys, you had a mentor in Bob Pearson. You had all you had out there. I mean, talk about mentors. Yeah, you just had like it was really. Um, I mean, that show in particular was really like a lot of everybody in Santa Cruz showed up for that. I yeah. remember seeing a lot of those guys yeah. like um, Skin Dog. I remember seeing him. like there was a lot of out people that you know a lot of young surfers that weren't necessarily out people but were there to pay homage to to Doug and. Yeah, you, you paid the well. All six of you shapers paid the ultimate homage to. It might have been five actually because of the longboard. I, I forget how many we had, but yeah, no, that was really cool, and that really kind of just was a very uh, high point in the whole in the whole thing. The whole the whole sacred craft slash boardroom show that was really cool, and and it, I really remember after after doing that, uh, Clint uh, Rusty's son came up to me, and said, oh, "Rusty really enjoyed watching you shape and." you know, Dodie Doe. And then sure enough, the next day, there's an email from Rusty, like, Hey, I really enjoyed, you know, doing this, you know, great economy, great technique, da, 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 da. And then he, he invited me to the, to the sh- tribute to him. Yeah. You know, which was, yeah. so, well, which I w- went and promptly laid an egg at that one. No, but, I don't think you did, but. Well, I did because I, I actually, let I shaped it. Let me just say this word that regarding Rusty and the Santa Cruz show, yeah. I went into the restroom at that written house building yeah. to take a pee and standing next to me is Rusty. And I'm like, Rusty, what are you doing here? You know, I was kind of blown away. And he's like, Scott, I wouldn't miss your show for the world. I'm here to watch the shaping. And yeah. that's what he did. And that's really says a lot about how, how much Rusty loves shaping. Like he oh, loves yeah. you guys go at it. No, I'm the same. I'm the same way. That's why I went to the original show. I just, I wanted to watch people shape and I want every show I want to go down and watch guys shape, you know? And it's just like that. I, I don't get sick of that, you know, yeah. <laughs> but I interrupted you. You were talking, we were talking about, cause Rusty did invite you to his, yeah. when we honored Rusty down here yeah. in San Diego and you were one of the shapers. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, like I said, I laid an egg, man, because it was like, we, we were supposed to shape a six footer and I shaped six two and, uh, I can't, I think it was one way or the other, but the thing was, I just was on autopilot and I just shaped yeah. and, and it was so funny when, when Clint and Rusty were in the shape room and I kind of knew which every shaper kind of knows what board is theirs. They can, yeah. yeah, one thing or another. And so I'm sitting there and I see them feeling the boards and Clint kind of goes through. And then also there's, 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 you know, goes from one, you know, five boards down to four down to anyway, my board was still in the mix and uh, I was like, okay, I kind of good. And all of a sudden they circled back around. They went through some other numbers and they put the bottom rocker on it. And, and Clint kind of goes, this is weird. Like, why is, why is this rocker running short of the board or whatever? And, uh, and so anyway, he took a tape measure to it. And then right then it, the light bulb went off like, holy crap. I, I had a brain fart. I, I shaped too long of a board. No wonder why I struggled with the template, getting the template right or whatever, you know? And uh, so they just took the board and put it off the side. And I was just like crestfallen. I was just like, oh my gosh, I just, I just blew it. And then when they came to do the awards, Rusty being a classic Rusty form was like, oh, there's some really good boards, really great shapes. In fact, there was a really wonderful 6-2 in there. And I raised my hand, man. And everybody looked at me and Rusty looked at me and, and I was like, guilty as charged, man. And Rusty was like, I can't believe you just fessed up to that. And I was like, whether I fess up to it or not, I'm going to live. I got to live with it, you know? And, uh, and still to this day, Roger Hines still 
he heckles me. Stu Kenson heckles me. And it's, it's a funny little thing. And, and Roger goes, well, you still, you still won the shape off. And I said, no, I won the six, two division. <laughs> shape off." <laughs> yeah, I know. I spoke with Rusty about it. And I do believe that your board was the board they were leaning towards until that final measure. I know. I just, but I, I laid an egg, man. And, and the thing is, it took me almost a year to get over that. Like every day I'd walk in my shaping room and I'd go, Oh my God, I can't believe I just, I purled in front of the, my peer, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. You, I mean, they loved your board. It was a beautiful board and you, you showed your chops. It was just, you know, it was a little slight oversight. Yeah, that's okay. You can always take it away, but you can't add it. Right. So I figured if I, if I really had to, I can go back and fix it up, you know, there you go. Yeah. And then, and then the, the yeah, go ahead. The Jerry Lopez show after that. Okay, know. yeah, you were in the Jerry one. Okay, right. Yeah. That was super cool. That was yeah. super, super rad. And I was so super honored to have him again call, you know, call me up and say, Oh, Wardo, I'd like to be in the do do And that was cool. And um, and I you know what was really neat is I brought down a piece of wood and I asked Gary, can I get a template off, off your template, your pipeline or template? And he said, Oh yeah, happy to do it. And he drew the template on there and signed it for me. And and so I've got that tucked in my shaping room. And, and that, oh, that's cool. That was really fun. And, the- and, you know, I'll tell you, Ward, that, that as you know, I'm, I meet with all these shapers and um, more often than not, they're like, I'd like Ward coffee. You know, mm-hmm. like every time I meet with a guy, they're like, what about Ward coffee? You know, and at some point I'm like, Ward's done it like four times. Like, can we get some new blood into yeah, it? You know, no, not I that I'm you. like, don't want you there, Ward, but I'm like. I need to freshen up the, you know, people are going really Ward again. They don't, they think that I'm picking them, but it's the shapers that just know that you're the guy and they yeah. pick you every time. Yeah. Well, what was crazy too is the, the last, the last two shows I've done, I've been the replacement, you know, so <laughs> for the, for the, Al, the Al Merrick show, I just came down. I flew down for the day and I'm at the show and that's when Christensen got food poisoning or he was too nervous or something. He's like, I can't do it. And and then you just like looked at me and like, suit up, you're going in. And I was like, uh, and then, well, let me check with Al to see if Al is okay with that. And then I said, well, I don't have any tools. And Chris was like, oh, they're in my van. I'm not feeling good or whatever. And that's when Roger Hine turned around and said, I just finished. My tools are in the room. Go in there and do it. And everybody looks at Roger, looks at me, and somebody says, dude, Roger doesn't even let anybody look at his tools. You know, and yeah. I'm okay, I better, you know, so anyway, I went and shaped a board and, you know, and then I had to fly, I had to, I had to catch a, catch a flight. So I just split and, and the, the classic thing is, is I, ju- I had an Uber to the airport. I hopped in this Uber car, I get to ride to the airport, I get out of the car and there's this perfect white halo on the seats where I was sitting from foam dust, right? <laughs> and I, I looked over the guy, the guy looked at the seat and I was like, oh man, I am so sorry. And all he could do is just growl at me. You know, <laughs> I just flew home, you know, and, 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 and that's, that's where that was. And then, and then as we know, the, the Ross, the Ross and show, you know, Pat calls me up the day before, like, Hey man, can you do it? And I was like, well, let me just check with my wife really quick. And I figure, okay, I can, we can rally, we can hop in the van. I can drive down. I can get two hour nap before showtime and I can get in there and shape a board. And yeah, that's how that all goes. But yeah, yeah. It's super fun to be part of and it's super fun to do. And which one of those was the most difficult? Each and well, we didn't even talk about the second Santa Cruz show. Yeah. On Mel. Yes. So I was I was the first shaper to go on that one with a shaping room that had lights on one side. Yes. Remember that? <laughs> well, there's lights on one side for everybody, though. I know. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I said, I said, if I'm shaping this board. With one set of lights, everybody's got to do it, you know. Um, but every show um, has its challenges, and it's just because of the time, and it's just because of the the what you have to what you have to achieve there, you know. Um, yeah. And fortunately, I've got five of them. I'm shaped, so I have. I probably should write five different chapters of, <laughs> of that. <laughs> yeah, you may have been in it more than anybody. I, I I've. I haven't done the math, but I think you're right there with probably Wayne or Roger. Yeah, yeah. I think I think there's some guys that are have done it as many times as I have. But the, and there's three time champions. I mean, didn't Ricky Carroll win three times? Rogers won three times. You know. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hold on for just a sec. I got to do my dogs. Hold on for just half a sec. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay. Yeah. Th thanks. Oh, good. Um, hey, before before we go on, though, I do want to thank and acknowledge you for creating the whole Sacred Craft slash Boardroom show and and the, just creating such an insane community and bringing to light uh, the craft of hand shaped boards and or and it's just like this. It for for people like me, it's just been super great to have and. Um, I got to talk to shapers I would have never in my lifetime been able to talk to and interact with. And I know there's a bunch of guys that feel the same way. And then people come to show and they actually have access to people. So, you know, props to you and, and, and pulling this off and making such a neat thing. I, just, I can't. Yeah. Well, doing that. yeah. Um, my wife always says to say, you're welcome. <laughs> Instead of <laughs> <laughs> peeves is people that say, thank you for saying yeah. thank you. But yeah, uh, regardless, yeah. I just, you know, I do do a little bit of work, but I just open the doors. I mean, you guys make the magic happen. All you guys bring in your beautiful boards. It's unreal. And this year we're honoring Timmy Patterson. Yeah. The icons of foam. Yeah. Uh, what do you know about Timmy? Tim, Timmy's interesting, man. Like over the, because of the show, I got to know him a little bit, but prior to that, I didn't know anything about it, but we had run kind of parallel in the sense that I had, I had made some channel bottom boards for some of my, my customers back in the early nineties. And they were living down in, um, down in your area and down in San Clemente area. And Timmy actually looked at him. And I remember him telling these guys, Oh, this, that guy shapes good boards. He knows how to do channels. Right. And, and so there was a little bit of, of back channeling stuff like that. And then once the show came around, I could just tell like, Oh dude, we're like-minded people. You know, like, you know, and so Timmy, you know, super talented guy, man. And super, yeah. super, you know, he's, but, but he's young, right? I mean, he's, he's my, uh, he's probably my age, like 57, something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, that's young. <laughs> <laughs> what are you 65 or something? No, no, no. I'm going to be 62 in September. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were closer to my age. Okay. This yeah. Is no, no. It's funny. Cause because I'm like I'm in that weird age group. Because most of the guys that are older than me, you know, like Pearson and, and a bunch of guys, like they're all in their early seventies. They're they're yeah. eleven years older. Than me. Hout's twenty years older than me. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of some people are like, oh, Ward, you're an old guy. I'm on. I'm not as old as those guys, but I'm not. I'm not in my fifties anymore. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you mentioned Steve Coletta. Um, yeah. How's Kalu Coletta doing? You know, he's got some cool surfboards. You know, I haven't seen Kalu in a while, but yeah, he's he's still he's got his dad's old shop in Watsonville, and he's still uh, he's still doing some boards. He plays he plays in a band, so he plays tons of music, right? And uh, yeah, he's cruising. He, he we actually had him working. My wife and I ran the Santa Cruz Elastic Surf League for ten years, so we had him on the judging panel for a while, and it was really good to have him on there. It was really really fun. Yeah, he's doing well. Good. Um, let's see what what have we missed? What what have um. It says it seems like we've said a lot here. Um, what's, <laughs> what's, next, lot of what's next for you? Like, what, what's what? Where are you at right now? You're shaping boards. Your sons are ripping, or your son? Uh, you have two sons. Two sons, Ben and Sam. Yeah, and and Sam's on the WQS. He's on the QS. He's in the regional thing. Um, he actually, he's heading out to to the East Coast tomorrow. 
Um, and my older son, Ben, he, he, he surfed on the QS for, for years and, you know, they got paid, they get, they got paid to travel the world for four or five years. And that was yeah. cool. great experience. Um, ben is, is a Lieutenant with the city of Santa Cruz lifeguards. He was actually down in San Diego last summer, lifeguarding down for the city of San Diego. And, uh, he's going back to school, um, getting, getting his cool. job done and yeah, good. good so but right. the, the future it's my wife and I are, um, we just, we have a lovely setup here. My shop is still going good. I love making boards. I'm teaching the boys how to shape. They're, they're, they're getting a little bit more time on their hands to, to come in and spend the time, uh, to learn how to shape up until, you know, up until recently, there was just like, okay, dad, I'm going here. I need these boards type thing or, or, oh, I just broke a board and I'm like, oh crap, I got to go build this other one. Um, but now there, there's a little bit of issues. Ben's really interested in shaping. Um, he's really uh, tuned in on, you know, rail shape and, and foils and bottom contour. So that's kind of, that's kind of cool. The only problem is he's a lefty. And so all my tools are set up for righty. So he comes to my room and everything's backwards by the time he does everything. So, Uh-oh. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I'm teaching, teaching them the shape. And I'm, my hope, my goal is because they are the, uh, the young generation that they can teach me how to use the CAD design stuff down the road and they can kind of help me keep track of that you know i mean <laughs> yeah yeah so um cool. but yeah other than that we're just we're just cruising it's a good thing and um I don't know. all right you're, you're you're traveling i know you're gonna go on a little trip eventually here and uh, uh well i just got back from sumatra i was in july i was in Sum- uh, south sumatra for two weeks uh surfing some pretty heavy waves on the mainland or in the islands mainland yeah. okay just south of Krui area yeah i've got a buddy who owns a a little place there at Krui, a yeah, surf yeah. camp yeah we were at mandiri surf club okay mandiri right on the beach and mandiri is an unreal beach break it's an insane beach break and when it's four to six foot it's like as good as it gets but <laughs> it was like six to ten foot we were up there the whole time so we ended up surfing the reefs uh north and south of there um and there's some some high consequence reefs around there and that was, was it good yeah, yeah, it was good. We surfed that place, uh, Way Jambu, which is left um, over a pretty shallow reef. That was pretty fun. And then we surfed uh, Jenny's right north of there and a couple of the beach breaks was fun. So that was a good trip. Long haul to get there. Um, yeah, it's a long haul coming home. Yeah, it was long coming home. Yeah, it's kind of brutal. Uh, Saturday, Saturday, my wife and I are going down to the East Cape and Cabo for, for a week. So cool. Kind of cruising around. And that spot in Sumatra, it's, it's kind of, was it, it seems like it's off. It's off everyone's radar. Like everyone thinks, oh, I'm going to the Mentawise or to the Telos right. or like but right. the Sumatran uh, mainland. Yeah, no one's. It's not really on anyone's radar. So well, you know, it's you know, it's funny. You don't think it's on the radar, but when we're at we're at the Man Mandiri Beach Club, and the guys who run the place go, oh yeah, they'll just they'll go down the long list of all the pros that come through there, and and, and if you start looking at a lot of the edits that these guys are doing, they're getting they're getting their shots from this area. And, oh, and interesting. Beach breaks, some of the slabby reefs and stuff like that. And you go, Oh, it's, <clears throat> it's on a lot of guys, but it's not really, uh, it's, it's not really blown. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, look, Ward coffee. Thanks. Thanks for being on the boardroom podcast, man. I'm super stoked to talk with you and get caught up. Well, thanks for inviting me, man. Yeah. You betcha. And maybe we'll see you in October. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I hope, I hope to come down for that. I know we've, we do have some other trips on the books, but I'm hoping to dovetail that in there with that and, and catch up and, and keep talking story, man. It's always good. It's a fun ride. How do people get a board from you? Like if somebody's listening like myself and they're like, I'd like to have a ward coffee surfboard. How does, how do we get a hold of you? You What's can go to my Instagram ward coffee shapes. Um, that's probably my, my most current thing. You can always look me up, uh, online ward at wardcoffeeshapes.com. Or if you can remember the number, you can call me at 831-459-0868. Sorry. Um, but yeah, that's how people get a hold of me. I'm pretty, pretty low key on that, but cool. All right. Well, thanks, Ward. It's good seeing you. Tell your wife I said goodbye and have a fun trip and we'll talk soon. All right, buddy. Good talking to you. Okay, bye-bye.